All right, everybody. Hello. Thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you for John for rescheduling. If you don't remember, we had the snowstorm when he was supposed to speak a couple months ago. Just, <laughs> just a little dust. Yeah. Uh, so before we start, I want to thank the Franklin Public Library Foundation, Jerome and Dorothy Holtz Family Foundation, and Carol and Tom Donovan as our sponsors uh, for the Great Decision Program. A little introduction about John Katzka. He's a retired senior foreign service officer with 37 years of federal and foreign service experience. He's also a Wisconsin native and graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I think that's pretty much it for the introduction for my part. Um, I, we are now sold out of books, but this is also our last um, session for tonight. And as you can see, this used to be on the 29th. And with that, I will hand it off to John. Thank you, Sam. Did everyone? Oh, we didn't turn this back on. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. Let me just tell you a couple of things about myself and what I've done, where I've been, and to give you an idea of what I bring before you tonight. I had I graduated from UWM, but I had been in the Air Force for four years before that, mostly in intelligence which for those of you who are in the, were in the military know that's an oxymoron. Um, and I went out, I graduated from UWM with a degree, well, I had a degree in political science, history, and international relations. Those were my majors. And I had three minors, so I was busy. Uh, went to Washington to work for the Defense Intelligence Agency as an analyst. I was working on first on Russian, Russian uh, oil pipelines, which is appropriate for this particular topic. And then I got involved with the prisoner of war issue. And I was working with, uh, I was involved in something called the Sante Raid uh, that we would try to go in and rescue uh, our, our pilots up in North, North Vietnam. And it was unsuccessful because they had been moved before we got there, and that was, the problem was our intelligence wasn't timely enough. So after I was there for a while, I recognized as a civilian working for the, for the Defense Department, I was a second class citizen. Uh, every step I would go up the ladder, there would be a military officer in charge, and if you were at DIA, it was someone who really didn't want to be there from the military side. And so I took the foreign service exam and it was a down period. And so I was able to get in. Started off in Thailand. I spent five years there during the Vietnam War era, uh, trying to make sure that as we were losing the war in Vietnam, that we weren't going to totally turn the Thai people against us because we had 50,000 young men running around Northeastern Thailand. So I was working with the, the government uh, uh, the mayor, the, the governor, the police chief, and the, the medical people, as well as the base commander and all the people that he had. And we would meet once a month to talk through these. We had four bases in northeastern Thailand. So my job was to run around all these bases and try to put out little fires. Went from there to Moscow. I spent two years in Moscow in the late 70s during the Brezhnev period. Went from there back to a Washington assignment where I was working on policy. Uh, from there I went to Zambia in Central Africa be because uh, it was a very interesting time because Kenneth Kaunda, who was the president, was in a position to be able to uh, focus on the Southern African issues. And this was when uh, South Africa was opening up, when we when Rhodesia became Zimbabwe and Mozambique came into its own. So it was a very interesting time. From there, I went to Yugoslavia, uh, when it was still called Yugoslavia, spent five years there, and left just before 
it started to have its serious problems and went back to Moscow, uh, where I spent two years, first in the Soviet Union and then finished up in Russia. Uh, and then from there I went back for another Washington assignment. I was the director of policy and programs for a television network in the U.S. government that worked with uh, television programmers as well as with, uh, we would get PBS kinds of programs to place in, uh, on, on uh, foreign television. Then I went back, uh, to, uh, from there I went to Romania, spent uh, two and a half years there and I retired out of Romania. But after that they called me back uh, as a special envoy to go back into the Balkans, first into Kosovo uh, after the shooting stopped. And then I went into Belgrade to help reestablish relations. And from there, uh, I, and then I went back into Macedonia, which is now called Northern Macedonia, uh, to, uh, uh, after the little civil war. And as a reward for that, they gave me two months in Paris on the left bank, full furnished apartment, a generous per diem, and had a wonderful time. Thank you to the Franklin Library for again hosting Great Decisions. Uh, I tend to write out my remarks. It keeps me more on track. I don't get off on tangents. And it also uh, helps me not get off into areas that I don't want to go into. A study of geopolitics of energy is not outside the influence of realism and idealism. We were chatting about that earlier. Realists look at what's pragmatic, what's where our national interest in an issue. The idealists look at the values, democracy promotion, human rights. Neither is right or wrong, but both of them have consequences and cost if you follow two, if it's the wrong time for that particular approach. Our foreign policy generally has been highly idealistic. And this goes way back, and this goes to the term <clears throat> American exceptionalism. Take a sip, a sip of water here. And that has been part of our <clears throat> historic uh, contribution to the world, but it also has a downside in that the rest of the world doesn't necessarily want us to come in and tell them how they should live and what they should be doing. We'll get into pieces of that tonight. Daniel Jurgen, who is probably one of the our single most important experts on on energy in his new book, The New Map, Energy, Climate, and the Clash of Nations, describes our topic thus, and I'll quote, <clears throat> geopolitics <clears throat> focuses on the shifting balance and rising tensions among nations. Energy reflects far-reaching alterations in global supplies and flows, driven in part by the remarkable change in the energy position of the U.S. And what he means there by the remarkable change is shale oil. And by the growing role of renewable and the new politics of climate change. Got a bunch of things to cover, but we should have enough time for your questions and observations. <clears throat> I spent most of my career and post-career as a student and practitioner of foreign affairs, fully aware of the importance of geopolitics in the conduct of foreign affairs. With that, our often idealistic approach to international relations largely subordinated geopolitics and its more pragmatic look at how the world works. When I think of geopolitics, five dimensions come to mind. Geography, politics, economics, population, and culture. Some are measurable, 
others not so much. Geography is easy. Location, location, location. Are we talking about a big, a medium, or a small country? Is it landlocked or does it have sea access? Mountainous or plains or a mix? Importantly, certainly for this talk, part of geography are our country's resources and for our purposes, energy. Politics, <clears throat> how are decisions made? Is it a democracy or autocracy or a mix of both? And very importantly, how stable is the political situation, regardless of whether it's a democracy or an autocracy? Economics. How self-sufficient is the economy? Or in the case of this talk, what are the energy constraints or advantages? And population. We're going to talk about demography in this case. Well, it means counting how many old people there are. And I can see a few gray heads around the room. How many are in the workforce? Are there population pressures or is there a declining population? Stuff like that. Culture. The history and geography of a country tend over time to define the culture. Landlocked people, especially in the mountainous Countries are very insular, keep to themselves, suspicious of outsiders. Think of Georgia and Armenia in that regard. That kind of, the people who live in flatlands, especially near the sea, are more open, expansive. And just as a little reminder, over the centuries we have moved from wood and I think I could throw in a little bit of dung here, because in Africa, they're still using dung for, dung for uh, cooking purposes. We have moved from that to, to coal, to oil, and natural gas, with a controversial spattering of nuclear, to the new technologies of wind and solar. I'll say a few words about other alternatives later. Each of these energy sources brought with it new technologies, often in terms of transportation and in the quality of life. It's also important to note that all of these sources of energy still exist, though economics and alternatives have reduced the use of wood and coal in the developed world, not necessarily the rest of the world. Though energy is a constant in a nation's definitions of its strength, its security, its prosperity, and its survival, it is subject to change and sometimes rapid change as we are witnessing with the impact of the war in Ukraine. Venezuela found itself on the wrong side of democratic practices several years ago, and its oil was banned by the U.S. Russia, Russia which has and criticized for its democratic practices wasn't banned until it invaded Ukraine. Curiously, with the ban on Russian oil, we are now opening up to oil imports from Venezuela, showing how quickly the roles can change. <clears throat> History also shows that access to energy products like oil can drive a country to invade, as did the Japanese in World War II. Japan was almost totally dependent on foreign sources of energy at the time. The Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait had Kuwaiti oil fields as an important goal. Energy is also a key piece in international environmental conferences. And I'll cite the Rio conference in 92, Kyoto in 97, and Paris in 2015. And there's a new kind of development. It's called, it, well, they don't even actually have a name for it. In 2022, Israel, Israel and Lebanon signed a treaty as a way to clear up who had access to what when there are conflicting lines of control or assumed control between countries. And because of overlapping and we're seeing this in the South China Sea now with, with China and the Philippines and Indonesia and Malaysia and others, that there are 
overlapping lines and that are going to cause problems china and the philippines had seemed to be moving in that direction of coming up with an agreement but now there are serious questions about their cooperation enhancing access to energy two two of these were cited in the great decisions booklet that is available in the library it is okay so anyone wants to get the booklet and and review all the the mistakes that i made tonight you can look at it because i did read it and i did use a couple of things from it the first one is classic realpolitik basically conquest would fit into that category japan in the 1930s iraq later the second one that the, 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 he cited was the liberal globalization. Energy generally responds to market influences, although OPEC has on occasion changed the dynamic one way or the other. And liberal in this particular case is not in the American sense, it's in the European sense. And liberal means uh, tr trade and business oriented almost what you would have thought would have been a Republican position, uh, the old Republicans. <laughs> and this global, this liberal globalization model is what we put into effect after World War II. Uh, we kind of put together not just the, the economic side, we put together the political side with the UN and the legal side as well. So. Uh, that will be a theme we'll come back to uh, when we start, start talking about how other countries are looking at that. And then to, to those two that were in the, in the book, I added another one called grouping, Groupings of Like-Minded Countries. And we're seeing that right now with the way Russia is moving oil and gas east to China and other authoritarian states. As the world seems to be moving into a duality of democratic and authoritarian regimes, this last category may be the model going into our near and maybe longer future. We're, 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 we have strengths and weaknesses in energy. Uh, the first one, this, this also comes out of, out of, the, the, out of the book. It's our influence over foreign producers. Though that has weakened, our economic strength gives us more influence over producers than any other country. But that's, that is more limited than I would think that the, the, the author of that uh, particular idea would have allowed. Dominant sea lanes. Our Navy is the short answer here. We are the most powerful, most, most widely spread Navy in the world. Capacity to upgrade energy infrastructure. We have the technology and personnel to do so. The question is when and how will we do it? Domestic production potential. As Daniel Jurgen noted, shale production has changed our energy potential immensely. Now the weaknesses. We will need to import some energy it's a, it's, a, it's a question of the type of energy needed and the cost. Our allies are more vulnerable. Yes, that's always a concern. Aging energy infrastructure. We have wholesale infrastructure concerns. Cyber attacks and supply chain issues requiring new and costly defense capabilities, especially for nuclear. I think it is useful here in terms of these weaknesses to point out that nations and less so that oil production is organized by nations and less so by corporations. Currently about 75% of oil production are state owned and 80% are controlled by OPEC plus. The move to non-fossil fuels requires a great deal of financial investment in infrastructure it is unlikely to replace fossil fuels in the next 10 to 20 years. That's a fairly optimistic one. There I saw others that go out to 20 to 40 years. 
before it's replaced. There is a component of the 2021 Infrastructure Act that will address aspects of energy and climate change. According to the White House press release, this act will, and I'll quote, help us tackle climate crisis by making the largest investment in clean energy transmission and EV, electric, electric vehicle infrastructure in history, electrifying thousands of school and transit buses across the country and creating a new grid deployment authority to build a clean 21st century grid. The 2021 Act was followed by the Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, describing more efforts to boost energy security and lower energy cost and promote clean energy supply chains and lots of good stuff. It's easier to see where things are going, much harder to determine the timeline for those changes. And that becomes critical if you study, try to study the future. It's easy to see where we're going, that things are going to happen, but when will they happen is the problem. In terms of the Infrastructure Act passed on November 21 and the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, this timeline question is important as we haven't seen any plans for the implementation of those action items. Among the major players, the EU and China both have limited fossil fuel resources and have invested earlier and more heavily in alternative sources of energy than the US. Question is, how important will this be in the next 20 to 30 years? And what advantages will they have as a result of getting into this before we do? Uh, it reminds me of, of what's called the leapfrogging technologies. Africa went from no telephones to cell phones and avoided that inter that other one, that one thing that we should have in the house that, that uh, sits there. The landline. Okay, what are some foreign pol policy options in the terms of energy? Jeffrey Morton, uh, do you have the, the, uh, the video from the, yeah, we have the video and the book. We'll add that okay. both of this. There, Jeffrey Morton, who conducted a master class for the Foreign Policy Association on this topic, identified four groups that affect American foreign policy views on energy. The first is liberal internationalism, what we have. This group asks, why change? We could keep the existing order. Energy, they point out, is a global need it fuels global trade and promotes clean energy. The next three are variations on a theme. All are conservative, but each of them has other positions in other areas of foreign affairs. The first two seem somewhat close in concept. America first, we, I think we've heard this particular uh, song before. It's a contemporary group of supporters want to focus on domestic production, reduced regulations, direct incentive, government more involved, and climate change is secondary. The realist conservative view, supporters of this view feel that we need to become self-sufficient in energy. In several ways, the realist view has been more or less the model for the U.S. approach to energy over the last several decades, even though it can be seen as contrary to liberal internationalism. The neocons, they were a group of former Democrats, mostly from the New York area, uh, who <coughs> left the party and became Republicans with under Ronald Reagan. And they were at a highly idealistic foreign policy positions, especially during the Cold War, but some of those who are still among that group are continuing those things today. They also want to avoid dependence and they want to deny access to rising powers and keep energy resources away from foes. According to Morton, at this time, Americans favor 
one of the three more conservative approaches. I did say that the realist model approximates what we're really doing in energy for decades while we were still supporting globalization. So in, it is possible that there is no contest between liberal globalization and the realist approach as it applies to energy. We like the cheaper goods, we get through globalization. But energy is too important to leave just to market forces. Searching the web months ago, even before the snows, looking for what has been written on the subject of the geopolitics of energy, I found that Harvard has had a geopolitics of energy project since 2011. Here I found, I found the holy grail. I'm not gonna to have to work very hard. I'm not gonna even need chat GPT or any of those to be able to write my paper. I was wrong. What I found was strong on organization and less so on substance, at least from what was available to me on the web. Their project aims to improve our understanding of how energy demand and supply shape international politics and vice versa. The study holds that the coming decades will be characterized by dual directions in, in the energy realm. We've actually mentioned this before. Yes, they say the desire to move away from fossil fuels is important, but oil and gas will remain dominant in the global energy mix. At the same time, the energy world will continue to need to find oil and gas to meet growing global demand. Remember, there are a number of developing countries that want to join that globalization club. As has been the case throughout the course of history, this shift in the global energy mix will bring with it major political and security changes. Together, these two factors, that is the drive to find more oil and gas and the shift toward alternative energies will be important determinants of the world in which we'll live. And it's not going to be an easy trade-off on this. They also came up with some realities and they raised some important points. They pointed out that the changing patterns of economic growth in the developed and emerging economies, there will be changing patterns there. Economic downturns often affect developing countries more profoundly than developed established ones. We're going to see that as it appears that we're moving into a global recession. Further, there are political changes and added pressures for reform, especially in the Middle East. I think this is where they slipped off the off the, uh, out of the pulpit and into another phase. The Harvard people may be reading more into the Arab Spring and other social reform programs. I would suggest that the underlying culture in that region, allowing for variations, of course, is autocratic and near-term suggestions that that will change are questionable. New methods and, me and mechanism of extraction. Certainly, we found economic ways to make shale marketable, though there is a price level and environmental concerns that discounts its utility. Environmental pressures and a need for adequate regulation. This issue will continue to plague policymakers trying to keep their economies afloat and get their political leaders reelected amidst the growing concern about climate change. Growing resource nationalism. It reminds us that one of the principal factors that brought on the Great Depression was protectionism. We are seeing examples here in the US and elsewhere where governments are protecting critical industries like chip making and energy cannot be far behind. Emerging technologies that will change the use of renewable energy sources. Some of these are still on the drawing boards, and I'll talk a little bit about a, a few of them. Others are expanding, but have limits in application because of geograph geography realities. Domestic and international actions to address climate change. Today, I would suggest that we have done more posturing 
that real reducing of the climate change requirements. Continuing evidence of more violent weather patterns may help to build public support for raising the priority of warming concerns. Changing foreign policy practices of the US and its international partners. This point gets us into a discussion on the current attacks on the global structure that we put into effect after World War II. China and rising powers were not party to those decisions, and they feel they need to be renegotiated. National strategies of key producer and consumer countries. We can see the consequences from the behavior of the Saudis and some other oil producers that dismissed our request to expand production because of the war in Ukraine. That kind of behavior is not limited to OPEC. Multinational corporations are beyond the control, if not the influence, of nation states. Johnson Controls, right here from Milwaukee, moved their headquarters to Ireland. Switzerland has a host of countries that are registered as Swiss, but in name only. Like international nonprofits, they are outside the mandate of the United Nations and are a rising consideration in foreign affairs. Before we get into alternatives, let's look at Guyana and how much how such opportunities for new sources of fossil fuel will keep the price of fossil fuels demand much more under control, but will affect the economic viability of alternative sources. Geopolitical Futures reports that by 2035, Guyana could be the fourth largest offshore oil producer in the world. It has fewer than one million people. Talk about upsetting some geopolitical master plans. We can expect other similar revelations as we go along. While this will offer a close at hand source, it will add more concern to global warming efforts. In Guyana's case, it is reported to have a low break even price, high quality oil, and a production sharing deal already in place with Exxon though they have not as yet exported national, natural gas, they plan to do so. Just ahead in April, Guyana will open three bids for three deep water and 11 shallow water blocks. And I mention this because they've invited the Chinese and the Indians to participate. And one wonders how that's going to be received in Washington. I left solar and wind out of this short discussion of possible alternatives, as we, I think, have a, a fair idea of what are the benefits, costs, and applications for those for solar and wind. The first one I'll talk about is wave energy. Like many of the alternatives I have compiled, it focuses on electricity production. It uses the movement of the ocean's waves to generate electricity. It, these waves cause the turbines placed in the water to spin, and then you have some electricity. Geothermal energy has captured heat from below the Earth's crust. It is generated from the radioactive de decay in that crust. It can be utilized to heat and cool homes as well as produce electricity. Biomass energy, also known as bioenergy, is created from the waste of plants or animals that can include vegetable oil, crops, manure, or wood products. A common method of creating electricity with biomass is through direct combustion, which creates steam. It's got those turbines going again, and there's electricity. You know, there are two ways to produce nuclear energy. We are familiar with nuclear fission. It has, its, it has its proponents and it has its detractors. Fusion uh, is 
according to the economist may make a breakthrough in the next five to ten years though the same article allows that the commercialization may not happen until 2050 so nuclear fusion is well down the road hydrogen is a clean fuel that when consumed in a fuel cell produces only water that can be produced from a variety of resources natural gas nuclear power biomass renewable power like solar and wind these qualities make it an attractive fuel option for transportation and electricity generation applications we currently use a lot of hydrogen today mostly for oil refining and producing fertilizer however apparently not all the ways to make hydrogen are green as they say most hydrogen now is made with natural gas and making it greener would be expensive the eu is about to lay down new rules for what is acceptable but i suspect the word expensive will be heard again so to mention a cutting idea idea in terms of hydrogen it appears that there is naturally occurring hydrogen. And right now there is a search for hydrogen wells in Australia, Africa, and Europe. It seems to occur naturally when water reacts with rocks. Lots of rocks, huh? So where are we now? And I borrowed from a lot of sources on this one, including Harvard's Megan O'Sullivan, who's a member of that project team I mentioned earlier. In the short term, as we wrestle with Russia and our allies over ways to punish Russia for the Ukraine invasion, we find that oil markets are harder to control than natural gas supplies. An oil price spike would directly affect the U.S. and the Biden administration is understandably, understandably sensitive to the price of gasoline. Our full court press on Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates to produce more oil immediately was rebuffed. And that's more of that uh, Democrats, ver the democracies versus autocracy issue. Energy markets get jittery when spare capacity shrinks or disappears. Although exact numbers are unknown, the International Energy Agency and others believe that the world's spare capacity is dwindling in the face of limited investment. Expanded investment, certainly in the U.S., will result in lawsuits from environmental and climate change activists. We can look at the reaction to President Biden's decision to open exploration in the Alaska Willow Project. We can expect that Western oil companies will have an uncomfortable position trying to balance pressures from both sides. We will see more examples like this, this group called Client First, an environmental law firm that recently sued Shell's board for failing to manage risks to climate change under British law. Additionally, politically, it will be more difficult for the Biden administration to release more oil from the energy reserves, considering how much they have released already. Of course, just as with cutting off natural gas to Europe, tampering with oil markets would not be without cost, in this case, let's say, for Russia. As Daniel Jurgen pointed out, one needs to remember that Russia makes a lot more money from its oil exports than from gas. A spike in oil prices would probably displease China, straining Beijing's support for Russian efforts to rewrite the rules of the international order. And of course, that is just what they announced on March 1st. Right now, they, are, they were cutting production 500,000 barrels a day, or about 5% of their production. Right now, I have not seen a readout on how this is affecting the market, OPEC or China. It also may have to do with their capabilities of producing as well, since they've been cut off from the kinds of technology 
that they, they need in order to keep the mines running. There were positives that came out of this winter from NATO's point of view. In Europe, it was warmer than expected, limiting the effect of the loss of Russian gas. Investment in renewable power accelerated in Europe. Though there's that timeline thing. When will these, there are project delays and supply chain issues. However, the word from the developing world is not as positive. Besides the war-related grain issues, much of the developing world is mainly focused on fossil fuels and access to them. China will get past this current COVID crisis, but when that will happen and what will be the cost and consequences are yet to be known. President Xi had replaced former Deng, President Deng Xiaoping's plan to rebuild the economy and avoid external adventures. He is now using a, a massive amount of resources that China has acquired in order to be able to press a more aggressive foreign policy. The pandemic, pandemic has been a bit of a monkey wrench in Xi's plans. As he reopens China, how could he she, how's that work out? <laughs> Return even temporarily to Deng's plan of focusing on the economy and downplaying political strategic goals. It is suspected that the cost of dealing with COVID has had a negative effect on China's financial reserves, affecting, and are you familiar with the Belt Road Initiative that China has, where we're trying to, both by water and by land, uh, create stable uh, alternative sources of moving goods into and out of China. The Belt Road Initiative is, is in trouble, raising many questions about how China will deal with these predominantly developing countries. Countries in the developing world are not able to pay on the principal or the, on the loans that they have and they've, China has already taken over a port, I believe it's in Sri Lanka, and they are probably going in to other places. The question is, they've thrown so much money into all of this. Uh, some, some of it is to buy political will, goodwill. Some of it is to that Belt Road Initiative concept of, of being able to get access to the resources they need. And the question, as China, through its large, larger access to Russian energy, its Belt Road Initiative projects, and other deals in the developing world, put together enough energy to sustain China's economy for the nearest term? That's a question. Don't have an answer for it. All of these considerations fit into the growing competition between the democracies and autocracies, pitting the US, the EU, Japan, versus China, Russia, Iran, and a number of other auto autocratic regimes, along with several others like India and Turkey, willing to play both sides to their advantage. With the Middle East oil producers, especially Saudi Arabia, in the autocracy camp, energy is a volatile resource that can quickly escalate differences into more uncontrollable actions. Considering that China is a major energy importer, does China have a compelling reason to be a leader in alternatives? Well, the short answer is yes. And over the last several decades, it has become a leader in electronic vehicle industries. Critical to that development are batteries. As Western automakers make more of a commitment to EV, as it's called, we will have to turn to, will we have to turn to China for those batteries? And how does that fit into our growing adversarial relationship? Additionally, there is no question that energy concerns run parallel to climate issues. As the developed world, mostly democracies, wrestles with their part of the global energy transition, there is Africa, Latin America, and the less developed parts of Asia 
all relatively low emitters, but anxious to develop their economies and the vehicle, vehicle most readily available are fossil fuels. Currently, China, Russia, and several democracies are courting Africa and Latin America for support on this democracies versus autocracies issue. Local resources also are part of the courtship, especially for China. The cost of the energy trans, trans, transition will be enormous, and other resource hogs in the U.S. budget, like Social Security and Medicare, like infrastructure needs, like military needs, will continue to have a higher priority. Will we have the will or the wherewithal to provide much more than token support for the developing world and their climate change needs? That is a question. I don't know the answer yet. And what you've been waiting for, the conclusion. Four factors stand out for me in looking at the near to medium term. The energy transition will take much longer than many believe, and fossil fuels will continue to remain a part of the mix, much the way wood and coal remain a part of the mix in the last century. Climate issues driven by increasing evidence of adverse effects, either in rising temperatures or unpredictable weather conditions, will produce local and international reactions and confrontations and will feed into this confrontation of the democracies versus autocracies, with the likelihood that rising powers in developing countries more likely will favor the autocracies because it gives the leadership of those countries the most flexibility and leverage in dealing with a re-examination and reordering of the existing world order. That confrontation takes us beyond the scope of this talk on energy, but the degree to which China and Russia especially challenge the rules of the existing world order will affect how both producers and consumers of energy reaction to the energy react to the challenge and who they decide to back in the process. So with that, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, John. We have time for questions or comments. I'll pass the mic around. Does anyone have one to start us out? I'm gonna grab a chair and sit over here. Would that work for the camera? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, getting old is not for sissies. <laughs> Uh, our country seems to be it's like uh, averse to nuclear energy. True and why? Well, I think it's it started much earlier. It's, I think it's part of that NIMBY thing. Uh, it, I think it, it, it's kind of like diseases that you can't see. It's kind of like the pandemic we just went through with COVID. There's all kinds of reasons to be concerned, but you can't, you can't put it to words, and that's what nuclear power is like. Uh, it, nuclear should be an important way in which to move out of fossil fuels. Um, they're, uh, hopefully, they're working on smaller production, uh, but this is not my area of expertise, so I won't dig too deep into that. Geopolitics is much more, more comfortable in that area. Oh, come on. <laughs> yes. This is far, far into the future, but how do you predict the Middle East dynamics will change when Saudi Arabia runs out of oil? Saudi Arabia's culture was there when Saudi Arabia was not an oil producer. It really hasn't changed significantly. There has been 
the people with enormous amounts of money don't necessarily behave like the vast majority of the country, uh, and especially when they're traveling abroad. But the culture, the basic culture, remains pretty much the same. It's a nomadic life culture. Um, we have probably, I think I mentioned this earlier, we probably have four or five cultures in the United States. And we can see some of this coming out as we talk about our divisions within the country. Uh, the South has a, the South has long had a different culture. There's a, a good book about the, the nine nations of North America. I think that's what it's called. And it concludes one from, uh, from Mexico and one from Canada. But basically it starts off with the founding of our country with New England spreading along to include the Midwest, including Chicago, and pretty much into the Plain States. And the Thomas Jefferson area, the tidal area, kind of didn't spread out as much. But Appalachia, which was right next to it, the Scots and Irish that were in Appalachia spread out. And that's, that goes through s s the rest of Illinois, south of Chicago. And anyone who spent a lot of time in Illinois knows that there's two different cultures between Chicago and the rest of the state. Uh, the West Coast is very different. And, well, and then the, 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 the other group, which was the fourth and fifth sons of British uh, nobility who were sent off because they were, they, one brother went into the military, one went into the priesthood, into the, into the religious community, and they had to do something with those sons. So they sent them over to the U.S. and gave them land, lots of land in the South, and they created those plantations. And that spread along the southern side of the United States. So those, that, that's the premise of, that, of, the, of this book I'm talking about. I can see you know, they're, they're how the difference between a, someone I know who's down in near uh, Champaign-Urbana and their political outlook and economic outlook, which is very different from what I see up here. Uh, definitely I can see that when talking to people who come up from the South. Not necessarily the big cities. The big cities are more like each other than they are like like the rural, more rural parts of the, of the area. So culture is a, a good place to look at culture. As I can talk with some, some authority is about Russian culture. And everyone's wondering, when is Russia going to implode? Well, in Russian culture, this is nothing, this is no big deal. Uh, the loss of lives is not, a, is not a critical factor. Individuals are not important. It's the group, it's the nation that's important. And there are people take a, a not, not everyone. Russia has had, has, has had a steady, over its history, a certain percentage of people who were not comfortable in that kind of cultural environment and left. Well, it's happening again now. Some of it kind of like the Vietnam War when, our, when a number of people fled up to uh, Canada to avoid the draft. There's, that's going on in, in Russia as well. But it's, it's, the, it's the group that matters. And so th throwing lots of troops at a particular point and having high casualties is not going to phase Russian culture as much as, as we look at it and are, are appalled by it. I'm delighted that I live here, but I try to understand where they're coming from. <clears throat> yep, uh, I was thinking about, uh, and I've read the new map, which is the book. Uh, ah, for well, Jurgen. And we have it at the library, by the way. And we also have his other book, The Five, which is ah. a real history of Russia. But in uh, one thing that's happened recently is, let's see, Saudi Arabia, we used to import their oil. And that's changed, and 
the biggest customer now is China, not so much the U.S. And they're, as a matter of fact, they signed their agreement. They're going to uh, buy their oil, not in dollars, but in yen going forward. Okay. And I think we've lost, we used to have Saudi Arabia as our, our real ally in some situations, not totally, but more so than not. And I think that's changing our alignment with Saudi Arabia, I think because of the oil uh, uh, consumption and going to China. Uh, I hope that relationship stays, but I think it's going to be very challenging. Well, this is where that realist versus the idealist approach comes in. Uh, during the Cold War, we supported a dictator in Congo by the name of Mobutu, who was as nasty a person as you could find. And we supported him partly because if he was replaced and we've seen this in other places where we've been messing around recently. When you take on a dictator, what happens after he's out? There's a vacuum, exactly. And, and when you're in a competition with another ideology as we were at the Soviets at that time, dealing with that dictator was less of a, it's kind of like I approach elections these days. It's called the lesser of evils. So you, you go through all the, the all of the stuff and you listen to all the stuff they have to say, and then you say, I don't like that, I don't like that, but I don't like that one, not as much as I don't like that one. Well, that's what foreign affairs can be like. Henry Kissinger was probably the most realist-oriented Secretary of State we had. Uh, and I moan his passing and that's from that office. We get very emotional about our foreign affairs. We, we, we take on, we look at, we look at Ukraine, we look at this President Zelensky and, and we're saying, this man is fighting against this evil giant. Well, it's much more complicated than that. It's much more complicated than that. It's not to excuse Russia for what it's doing. But from their point of view, this, is, this was 30 years in the making, and we participated in that process by pushing NATO closer and closer to Russia and offering Ukraine, which had been part of Russia since 1654, and offering Ukraine membership in NATO was just a, a bridge too far. Bush actually offered that up, but I don't think any of the European allies were on board with that. Uh, because they never took any formal steps to. Get we have we we have stayed in NATO yeah. because it gave us a a inside track in European affairs okay. and an important military side of it, political side of it. But the Europeans are not happy about that. They would prefer. French especially would prefer that we just stay back here and mind our own business, other unless there's unless they need us. I spent most of my career with the idea that you tell the French just the opposite of what you want them to do. I never practiced that, but it was a thought in the back of my head. <laughs> so do you want to give the, on the other hand, regarding Ukraine, because you said it's not as clear, yes. and if uh, Zelensky is maybe not this. Well, Zelensky is, 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 so is was, first of all, he was a comedian, and he has found a wonderful stage. Oh, he is very good at it, too, and so I'm not taking that away. Uh, I said 1654, Russia, the Ukrainians, the Zaporozhye Cossacks, and these were mostly Russians that came down. You can go back before that to the ninth century when it was the Kievan Rus on the border, on the, on the Volga River, 
not in Kiev, but the Kievan Rus. And, and the Rus were Scandinavians that were invited, royalty that were invited to come in because the, 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 the Slavs didn't feel that they could manage themselves with, with Constantinople being so close down the river. And so uh, the Rus came in, and that's where the term Russian comes from. It's from those Scandinavian, it's a Scandinavian word. Uh, so 1654, the hetman of the Zaporozhye Cossacks got tired of the Poles trying to make them into Catholics and, and said, we're Orthodox. So we're gonna, we're, we switch our allegiance to, to was I think Nov 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 Novgorod at the time was the capital. Uh, and so they switched their allegiance. At that point, Ukraine was a landlocked country. The entire southern part and the entire eastern part was controlled by the Ottoman Turks. In the 1750s, Russia took all that away, including Crimea. Uh, Crimea for a Russian is, is kind of sacred. It is also strategic for the Russians, and it's always considered to be Russian. Odessa is a Russian city, uh, the predominant Russian and Jewish city. So, so the 1750s, and then they began their eastern expansion out to the Pacific Ocean. So those are factors. This is how, at the end of the, of, of the Soviet Union, I was in Moscow at the time when it all came, came to an end. I was there through the coup attempt when, when Gorbachev was down in the Crimea, at the Crimea, uh, at, his, the, at, the, at the premier's guest house. And it came apart and, and uh, it was uh, Yeltsin conspiring with uh, the guy from, from, from Ukraine, his name jumps, up, jumps out of my head, who sat down and said, let's, get, let's break this old model. And so they said, and they convinced, uh, we, were, we were not happy about this. We, this is when Baker was making speeches saying, uh, be careful about what you do. And, and there was, and Bush at, at what that time went down to Kiev, I actually went down there with him because the, he had been in Moscow before that and, and, and advised the people there to be careful about how they proceeded. Bush Sr. was a much more pragmatic viewer of foreign affairs. Uh, so the background to this is in the early days of the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were going through a, a very serious case of PTSD, the, the entire country. And we were running all over the place on that. I mean, I, we had academics pouring in. We had, uh, at the time of the, of, the, of, the, of the coup and the collapse, we had 200 American correspondents in Moscow. Only about five of them spoke Russian. So they were coming to the embassy looking for handouts. So it even, and we had, you know, every member of Congress had to come at least once or twice. And every cabinet member had to be there. And they had to have photo ops when they were there because they wanted to show their, their constituents, you know, we are there and we saw what's happening. Uh, so Russia came out of that, didn't come out of that until Putin in the late 1990s. And then the critical factor was the oil increase, the oil price increase in 2004. Russia put together over $600 billion in, 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 in a, what's called a sovereign fund that it could use. And in Russia, they don't have to, there's, there's, they don't have to worry about priority, where the priorities are. The priority is, is on national security, first and foremost, possibly also on regime, uh, regime protection. So I'll allow that to be part of that. And, uh, and in, in terms of 
going in and cleaning up whether or not there is there, you have good access for people with handicaps or anything like that it just doesn't come into the it just doesn't come into the discussion it's it, the prior that's why Russia as a an economy probably around the size of Italy's maybe even a little smaller can be a world power simply because they will focus their resources on being that power. They don't necessarily do it brilliantly. They don't necessarily do it with finesse. It is very direct. Uh, what we're seeing and, and how they're behaving in Ukraine is not surprising to someone, anyone who's watched Russian culture. And it goes back to the czars as well. We went from the czars to the commissars to Putin, and there's not, Russian culture didn't change in the process. So this is all that's going to happen with Ukraine? <sighs> what is going to happen with Ukraine? No, I mean, uh, the Russians were always going to invade Ukraine, is that what you're saying? No, no, I'm not saying that. I think that you, Russia, much of the First of all, Russians think of Ukraine as part of Russia. They, they, this is, uh, uh, the thought I wanted to leave. At the end of, this, at the, end of the cold of, of the Soviet Union, we chose to use those republics as the model, as the template for the division of the Soviet Union. Russia was not in a position under, uh, certainly under Yeltsin, who was uh, a gadfly, at best, uh, to be able to resist that. And there was also, I can understand why these other places would like to, but we're also going to see is that Russia is such an important factor in that love and their life, that area, that they have, they're naturally connected. You're watching the stands right now, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, we call them the stands. Uh, they're, now they're being investigated for serving as, as a conduit for uh, supplies into Russia. Well, I wasn't be surprised at all that's going on. I think Turkey and, and other countries are doing the same. China's uh, just invited the stands to one-on-one -on -one with Chairman Xi. Yes, you, well, you just went through there on his trip to Moscow. Yeah. Watch this autocracies versus democracies thing. Uh, they have some advantages, meaning that they can make decisions a lot easier than we can. I'm not sure we can make decisions anymore. But uh, in the long run, when they make, look at how China reacted to COVID, shutting down the whole country, and now have had to back off of that, and at, in ways, basically are starting over again because they are, they're having to go through this. But they can shut the borders, and, or they can shut off the information flow, and so we're not really looking at it. We get pieces of it popping up in, in various chat talks. So they have some advantages, and we have some advantages. Uh, it would be nice if we could put our, our house in order, but I'm not sure we're ready for that yet. You know, you said that, uh, uh, that Zelensky was uh, good at what he does. You know, he's kind of an actor. I mean, uh, yes. the last time we had an actor in office. He did pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> the last time was, yeah, yeah. Reagan does, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that we have maybe time for one more quick question and then we'll have to wrap this up. I was just wondering, um, because I know a large portion of Ukraine is Russian. A lot of people in Ukraine are glad that they're being invaded. But where did Ukraine get all their energy to heat their country this winter? Well, first of all, it was a, a milder winter than everyone ex than anyone expected. Um, uh, there was... There was uh, uh, gas flows coming back from Poland over the same pipelines that were <laughs> sending the, the gas forward. So I don't 
first of all, there's a whole bunch of places in Ukraine where it isn't really very nice to live. And there's an awful lot of Ukrainians who have left. So that, that it's cut down in that regard. And I bet they're back to burning, burning furniture and things like that is in a war kind, what happens in a war, war like situation. Well, did I answer your question in terms of it's more complicated than? Yes, you did. Okay. What do you think about the general U.S. foreign policy where we always seem to be back in the underdog with the, in Iraq? We had the, we went against Saddam Hussein. And in Libya, we went with ousted of well, we went, actually, we were more on the back page on Libya because I think the Europeans took a more aggressive position there. But Afghanistan, I mean, I've said this before, not to you. <laughs> if we had gone into Afghanistan, and it, it, those of us who were there, and I was in, actually in Macedonia at 9-11, and uh, watching, uh, CNN was always on, but the volume was off. And so I glance up and I see smoke coming out of it. And then I'm almost literally, I'm starting to focus on this. And, and a plane goes in. I run down the hall, grab the ambassador, pull him off because he couldn't have a television in his office. At surveillance and things like that. And so we watch this. Um, the country was angry. I mean, there, was, there were a couple of people who say that they were against what we did, uh, but they were really in a very small, and we always have someone who says that we're against what we want to do. But if we had gone in and displaced the Taliban out of, out of power and pushed Al-Qaeda off into Pakistan, is basically what happened, because we didn't, we didn't, this, they, we didn't eliminate the Taliban, and we didn't eliminate Al Qaeda. Uh, if we had said, "Okay, this is a lesson. We're leaving, but if this happens again, we're 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 going to be back, and it's, you're going to get hurt." Think of all the money and lives we would have saved in the process, and look at what we left behind. We have a 14th century culture that we went in and tried to doctor. And it, it, it's unraveling. And the people who are there who were, who were enthusiastic about receiving what we, were, what we were saying are the victims. So we need to, there are costs and consequences for any foreign policy decision. We are much too quick to react and not really look through what the options are. Yes. Right. We do have to end. The library is going to be closing in just a little bit, so sorry, but well, she gets special. Yeah, she gets special. We can do, we can do one more question, and then we do have to wrap up. Thank you. You talked about the confrontation between democracies and autocracies. Do you see that changing? That there will be more of the democratic countries becoming more autocratic and vice versa? I think that there will be more autocracies, but I think the critical factor is something that I said up there. It's, and some will be a mix. We blessed a number of countries simply because they had elections and called them democracies because it was in our interest during the Cold War. Uh, just having an election is not a democracy even a free and fair election. It, there's a whole bunch of other things that go with it. Transparency, rule of law, freedom of the freedom of press. Well, the, many of these countries in the developing world have never had freedom of press. And they don't, and most, many of the people in the country don't care. Well, actually in our own country, we have a lot of people who just don't care. So, isn't it, isn't it a 
nice positive <laughs> story that I'm laying before you as we wrap up great decisions for 2023. <laughs> <No>. <laughs>